Thank you. Before we begin our lesson today, uh, Kathy Crandall is going to lead us in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful uh, world that you've given us, and, and we praise you for the beauty that you created for it. And, um, we thank you for that. We thank you for, especially for the Savior and the opportunity to have a heaven. We ask that you would help us to think of that and to, as we live our daily lives to understand that this world is fleeting and that eternity is something we can't even comprehend. And help us to think of heaven and, uh, and yet help us to be better servants of yours. We ask that you be with us in this class this morning and that you would open our hearts and our minds and help us to uh, accept the things that we hear and to act upon them and to put them to practice in our lives so that we can be uh, lights in this world, that we can uh, bring glory to you. We ask that you would be with those right now that are suffering in any way, whether they're sick or emotionally, and to help those that are ill to come back to their normal walk of life. We ask that you will continue with us and walk with us each and every day and forgive us for the things that we do wrong and help us to do better. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you. It was a beautiful prayer, and it touched pretty much on a lot of the things I'm actually going to talk about today. <laughs> Um, this is going to be somewhat of a fundamental lesson, uh, uh, so a lot of it would things that would, would be obvious and things that we already believe and trust. Uh, the name of this lesson is Seek First His Kingdom. So if we look at the word seek, that means to diligently go after, to desire earnestly. First means it's of greatest importance the most important thing to us. His kingdom is his rule in my heart. So I'm to seek diligently as most important Christ's rule in my heart. Jesus introduces this idea in Matthew 6 verses 24 and 25 when he tells us, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in wealth. For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Do not worry then, saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear for clothing? But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Of course, we can see from this passage that man is a dual being. We have both a physical body and a spiritual body. And Jesus is saying, it's your spiritual life that is of most importance. And if you will seek him first, the things that you need in your physical life will be provided. Well, we may ask, why would I want to do this? Why do I want to seek first his kingdom? And so now we're going to look at some very fundamental principles that we all should have uh, true in our lives. I think there are five things that are essential in order to put Christ first. First of all, just our very core beliefs. What is it we believe about God? Secondly, knowing what we believe about God, it will affect our goal in life. What's my purpose? What am I supposed to be accomplishing? Number three, it has to be from the right motive, the right attitude, the right heart. And then when those things are true, number four, we can set the right priorities. And then number five, we can maintain a balance. In the book, uh, she puts it this way: God must be core of our, the core of our being, and His influence must permeate all the activities of our life. When God is given that priority, everything else will fall in place. So, first of all, what are some of our very core beliefs about God? What is it you believe about God? In Hebrews 11, verse 3, we're told. By faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God 
so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. And in verse 6, without this faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to him must believe that God is and that he will reward those who seek after him. And what can we know about God just from looking at our universe and all the things about us? Romans 1 verses 19 through 20. That which is known about God is evident. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and his divine nature, these are clearly seen and are understood through what has been made. Uh, the Bible says it's a fool that says there is no God. It's just evident by what's around us. There was an intelligent designer. This didn't happen by chance. Therefore, we believe in such a God. And he also, of course, revealed himself through his word. And we're taught in Genesis 1, verses 26 through 27, where God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So we see not only do we know a God exists, but he is our creator. He made all that we see. And he made mankind unique and special above any part of creation because we are made in his image. We are taught in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7, that our body, or the dust, will return to the earth as it was, but the spirit will return to God who gave it. Again, we uh, see here that man is a dual being. We have a physical body, and we have a spirit that's made in the image of God. Because he is our creator, we can expect them, then that he has a purpose for us. And he has things that he requires of us. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 through 16, it says, But like God, the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves in all your behavior, because it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. As we see then being made in his image, we're to carry on the characteristics that God uh, has uh, shown us that are holy. Uh, but we know as a whole, mankind has not lived up to this. Our purpose is to glorify God, bring honor to him, but we all have failed. Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So man is in a lost condition and he's separated from God because of his sin. But we have a loving God and he has accomplished what no one can do. He has found a way to save us. In John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So we can see God's answer for sin and our lost condition is Jesus. Now, Jesus represents a lot of things to us. Uh, he was a wonderful example, uh, the greatest teacher. He's a great healer, physician, uh, worked many miracles. But the main purpose for Jesus coming was to save us. He's our Savior. So first of all, we must recognize we are in a sinful condition. We are lost, and we have to have him as our Savior, or there is no hope. Jesus taught himself. The I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. If these things then are our core beliefs, we will do as it is exhorts us in Hebrews 12, 1 through 2. We will lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and we will run with endurance the race set before us, and we will fix our eyes on Jesus who is the author and perfecter of our faith. Another core belief we have is that one day we will face Jesus in judgment. We are told in Hebrews 9, 27, it is appointed for men to die once, 
and after this comes the judgment. In Romans 14, verses 10 through 12, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. And these were the very things that the apostles taught that the early uh, church first began. Uh, as recorded in Acts 24, 24 and 25, this would be how Paul would go about preaching everywhere. It says, he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus, and he taught Governor Felix about righteousness, that is how we're made right with God, self-control, <clears throat> that we must repent and put away sin, and the judgment to come. Well, if all these core beliefs are established and it's what we, one truly believes in his heart, it will affect our goals in life. What should then be our greatest desire? It ought to be to please God. We're here to serve him. And also, of course, to gain eternal life. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, we are admonished. Do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things that we see about us, they're temporal. They're going to pass away. They don't last. But the things that are not seen are eternal. And we are given, of course, a scene of what the judgment will be like in Matthew chapter 25. So if somebody wants to read that, it's Matthew 25, verses 31. 1-34 When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him then he will sit on the throne of his glory all the nations will be gathered before him and he will and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from his goats and he will set the sheep on his right hand but the goats on his left then the king will say to those on his right hand come you Blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Okay, and also verse 41. <laughs> Why don't you go ahead? 41. Then he will also say to those on the left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. All right, so we can see here from the judgment scene, there are only two possibilities. You will have taken Jesus as your Savior, and you will be rewarded with eternal life. If you have refused or not acknowledged him as your savior, you will be condemned eternally. So our next part is, if we have the right core beliefs and our goal is to please God, we have to have the right heart, motive, or attitude in order to please God. We need to have a heart that serves him with love, out of purity, and obedience. So all these are required. <clears throat> Uh, to be obedient is taught in John 14, 15, and 21, where Jesus says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him. Also in 1 John 5, verse 3, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. So again, one of the requirements is that we must be obedient or submissive to God. And it must be out of love. When asked about the greatest commandment, Jesus replied in Matthew chapter 22, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. Second to it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Uh, regarding working out of love, we're taught in 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3. If I should speak with the tongue of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries, and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. 
And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. So these are three essentials that must be met in order for us to set our priorities. Now, what are our priorities? What do those involve? Well, there are three main areas. The use of our time, the use of our energy or talents, and the use of our money. First of all, we'll look at how we use our time. In view of eternity, life here is short. Scriptures exhort us then to make good use of our time, to use it wisely. Uh, we'll read now in Psalms 90, if somebody wants to read that, verses 1 through 12. This is a psalm that Moses wrote. Psalms 90, verses 1 through 12. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations, before the mountains were brought forth. For ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Thou turnest to destruction and sayest, Return the children of men. For a thousand years in my sight are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. Thou carest them away with the flood, they are as asleep. In the morning they are like grass, which groweth up. In the morning it flourishes and groweth up. In the evening it is cut down and withers. For we are consumed in thine anger, and in thy wrath are we troubled. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret and sins, the light of our, thy countenance. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We bring our years to an end as a sigh. The days of our years are threescore years and ten, or even by reason of strength, fourscore years. Yet it is their pride but labor and sorrow, for it is soon gone and we will fly away. Who knoweth the power of thine anger and thy wrath according to the fear that is due unto thee? So teach us to number our days that we may get us a heart of wisdom. Right, thank you. All right, so he makes a, the, the uh, uh, scriptures teaching here all about what we believe about God and that our sins are ever before him and that time doesn't mean anything like it does uh, to us as far as God's concerning. Uh, you know, a thousand years is but a day to God. But he summarizes in verse 12 what application we should make from all this. We're, he says, teach us to number our days so that we will gain a heart of wisdom. Um, another psalm exhorts us in Psalms 39, where it says, Lord, make me to know my end, and what is the extent of my days. Let me know how transient I am. Behold, you have made my days as hand breath, and my lifetime as nothing in your sight. Surely every man at his best is a mere breath. And now, Lord, for what do I wait? My hope is in you. Uh, we will face all kinds of situations in life uh, that time will involve. Uh, we're told in Ecclesiastes uh, 3, verses 1 through 8, uh, the different kinds of uh, situations and things that will happen to us in time. It says, to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. There's a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to gain and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to throw away. <clears throat> a time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silent and a time to speak. A time to love, a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. And we probably all experienced a good portion of those in our life. And in 
using our time in these situations, how wisely have we handled these? You might ask yourself. There are, uh, as we say, many and various events we will face in life. We are exhorted in both the Old Testament and New Testament to use our time wisely. Uh, we'll look at what Proverbs 6, verses 6 through 8 say. If somebody wants to read that. Proverbs 6, verses 6 through 8. <clears throat> Consider her ways and be wise without having any chief officer or ruler. She prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food in harvest. Okay, so we see this from the example here of the ant that God has created. We're exhorted to be productive. God expects us to use our time to produce and be fruitful. And Colossians 3, verses 23 through 24. Uh, someone can read that one. Colossians 3, 23 through 24. And then whatever you do, do it heartily, as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. All right. So regardless of what our duty is, what our uh, occupation may be, we're to work at it heartily as though we were serving or working for the Lord. In Ephesians 5, verses 5, 15 through 17, it teaches, Therefore be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So in light of all these scriptures, we can see that uh, how we use our time is of great importance. What are some wise ways we can use our time? All right, in Bible study, because how are you going to know what the will of the Lord is? It's only found through Bible study. Uh, anybody else? Well, obviously, we have to spend time in worship. God requires that of us. Time in prayer. Time in doing good and serving others. Time in caring for our own families. Time in doing honest labor. Uh, there's just many things that require our time, but these should be a priority. Worshiping God, studying our Bibles, prayer, caring for our families, serving others, and doing honest labor. And I'm sure there may be other things that could be added. So that was the priority of our time. Now we're gonna look at the priority of how we use our energy or talents. We are all stewards in God's kingdom and he expects us to use our talents and our energy to carry out our responsibilities. Anything that he has required of women, uh, we ought to be involved in. Uh, in Titus 2, verses three through five, it talks a little bit about some of the works that women are involved in. It says, The older women, likewise, they should be reverent in their behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of that which is good. They should admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. So here we see uh, enumerated several things that God requires of women. Uh, of course, we're familiar with the parable of the talents and how those men used the talents they were given. Uh, the man with the five talents, the two talents, and then the man given just the one talent. So if we turn over to Matthew 25 and look at that parable, um, See, I'm going to look at verses 28 through 30. This is regards to the man that had the one talent and wasted it, Did, didn't do anything with it. And the master tells them, take the talent from this man and give it to the one who has 10 talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness, 
there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So we can see God holds us accountable for our stewardship and using the talents he has given us. Now, God doesn't require more of us than we can do. And we learn this in 2 Corinthians 8, verse 12. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 12. And this is regards to the, uh, the chapter that has a lot to do with giving. But it says, if there is first a willing mind, it is acceptable according to what one has and not according to what one does not have. So God does not expect more of you than you're able to do. And then our third area of priority will be how we use our money. We are accountable for how we view our money and how we use it. And the question may be asked, where are you investing? In Matthew 6, Jesus talks about this. Matthew 6, verses 19 through 21. I'm going to get someone to read that. Matthew 6, verses 19 through 21. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moss and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moss nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So obviously did Jesus making the contrast as he had previously when he said, uh, you cannot serve two masters. It, where are your treasures? Where are you investing? Is it in earthly, worldly things? They're going to pass away. None of it lasts. But rather, you should put your treasure in heaven or those things which are spiritual. We are also warned in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Make sure that your character is free from the love of money and learn to be content with what you have. Also in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires, which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and have pierced themselves with many griefs. God also gives us a principle about how we're to give and use our money. Uh, this is taught in 2 Corinthians <laughs> chapter 9. Now I say this, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that always having sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. So we may ask then, what are some wise ways to use our money? Anybody have any suggestions? First, give them to the Lord. All right, we are co commanded on the first day of the week to, to give as we've been prospered. So that is a commandment to give on the first day of the week. Um, just our, yes, go ahead. Hospitality. Hospitality, spending <laughs> money on our others, uh, serving others. Mm -hmm. And obviously we have to pay our obligations. If you've got bills, if you've got things you, you've obligated yourself to, you, you've got to use your money to pay those obligations. But he also expects us not to get into so many obligations. Very um, good. Yeah. Yes. The church can't be what's left over. The, right. Good. That's a good, that's good point. Yes. Uh, and uh, it, just be prudent and save. I think that's a wise way to use your money. You, you, there's no reason to go out and spend every last penny of it uh, if it's going to cause you, you know, heartache further down the road. Uh, so be prudent, but save. And, and in this regard, you know, some of you may have some good tips of, of, of ways you work, but all of, us, all of us could have a budget, and you, you would just have to look at your bank account and look at what you own and um, what monies you have, and you're going to have to figure out, you know, the best use of your money. But again, as Karen said, make sure you have a place where 
first of all, where you've given to God and uh, the work that he requires in that regard. Well, we need to put all of these principles in balance in our lives. And I think the book had a good little illustration. Some of y'all may have already read it. But in the uh, little lesson book on page 26, the author gives us a uh, just a visual of what we mean when we're saying to put all these priorities in place. So uh, I'll go ahead and uh, read the whole story. It starts there in the middle of page 26. A professor stood before his philosophy class and had some items in front of him. When the class began, he wordlessly picked up a very large, empty mayonnaise jar and proceeded to fill it with golf balls. He then asked the students if the jar were full. They agreed, yes it was. The professor then picked up a box of pebbles and poured them into the same jar. He shook the jar lightly. The pebbles rolled into the open spaces between the golf balls. He then asked the students, is the jar full? They agreed it was. The professor next picked up a box of sand and poured it into the jar. Of course, the sand filled up everything else. He asked them once more if the jar were full. The students responded with a unanimous yes, and the professor then produced two cups of coffee from under the table and poured the entire contents into the jar, effectively filling up the empty space between the sand. The students all laughed. Now, said the professor, I want you to recognize that this jar represents your life. The golf balls are the important things. Now, I notice he didn't mention this, but he should have said, first of all, uh, loving God or serving God. But he does mention your family, your children, your health, your friends, even your favorite passions. And if everything else was lost, and only they remain, your life would still be full. Now the pebbles represent other things that do matter, like your job, your house, your car, and the sand is everything else, the small stuff. If you put the sand in the jar first, there would be no room for the pebbles or the golf balls. This is the same thing about life. If you spend all your time and energy on small stuff, you will never have room for the things that are most important to you. So pay attention to the things that are critical to your happiness. Now, these are some of the things they suggest. Uh, play with your children, take time to get medical checkups, take your spouse out to dinner, play another round of 18 holes. Uh, there will always be time to clean your house, to fix your disposal, but take care of the golf balls first the things that really matter. Set your priorities. The rest is just sand. And then one of the students raised her hand and inquired, well, what about the coffee? And the professor smiled. Oh, I'm glad you asked. It just goes to show you that no matter how full your life may seem, there is always room for a couple cups of coffee with a friend. <laughs> well, I thought that was pretty good. So we can see uh, we need to put these principles in our lives. Many of our priorities, of course, will be the same, but we are unique and our daily schedules and our plans will vary. We have different responsibilities. Some of us are grandmothers, mothers, sisters, daughters. Um, some of us have jobs outside our home. Some of us are caretakers. I mean, there's many different responsibilities and it will vary. Uh, we have different talents. Our finances are all different. The opportunities before us are all different. So I admonish you, don't be comparing your situation with those of others as to be critical of them or even too hard on yourself. But be honest, pray to the Lord, and work on doing what God has put into your life to do. Each of us is a steward in his kingdom and we will give an account of ourselves before God. And that's my lesson. <laughs> so unless you have anything else to add. Sorry, it was a little bit shorter. But...
Yes. One of the commercials that I really hate hearing on the radio or even seeing on TV <coughs> are those commercials that say, don't let the credit card companies fool you into thinking oh. you have to pay your debt. You don't. I mean, what are we teaching people? You know, you you and I under I, and I understand things happen. You got to use your credit card, and then it's hard to pay it off. I get that, but it makes it sound like huh. charge whatever you want on there. You mm -hmm. don't have to pay it back. There are ways out of that. You don't have to be responsible. You know, and that just uh, I can't stand hearing that commercial. <laughs> I'm sorry about that, but that's a very good point. Yes, because uh, we're definitely, uh, I think if you obligate yourself, you're obligated. I mean, you know, you'll have to do the best you can with it. it may, well, I know with student loans, it may take you a lifetime to pay them off because they can get really steep. <laughs> but you've obligated yourself, when, you know, once you've. Yeah, we've all had situations I know where it took a long time to pay something off. Mm -hmm. But it, you're responsible for it, you know? So to tell people, don't let them fool you. You don't have to do that. Uh, There's something that bothers me. <laughs> something that I was thinking about um, when we can like make time for, to have money to help someone else in kind of life Starbucks money. <laughs> <You know what? laughs> and then I work with my adorable aide who work makes maybe twelve dollars an hour, works twelve hour shifts, four or five days a week, mm -hmm. with two kids, is a single mom. But yeah, wants to buy my kid diapers. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, huh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's very humbling. You know yes, it is. Like, all she does is just love me. And she's like, your kid needs diapers. I'm like, you don't have money to give my kid diapers. You mm -hmm. should take care of your own kids right now. Mm -hmm. No, they're fine. They're well taken care of. And I'm like, you just had your sister make all the shirts for this birthday party because it's expensive. Boy. Like, you know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. perspective sometimes that it's very humbling. And in regards to money and how people <laughs> use it, uh, I've been told before that the state of Mississippi is one of the poorest states you know, in our country. But the one of the most giving as far as benevolence, wow. and I think it's because if you come for where you don't have a lot, you can see the need, and and you, and you want to give to help. But when you have a lot, a lot of times the tendency is to kind of uh, say, uh, protect it, mm -hmm. like oh I don't want to lose it. I you know worked when I got all this, and now I don't want to you know lose it or do something, and and then the people who have a lot don't maybe. Of course, Jesus taught that per, uh, well example, one parable where the lady just gave mm -hmm. all, all the last of what she had, mm -hmm. and then the really rich they gave, but I mean it, mm -hmm. they, it didn't really affect their pocketbook. Right. It wasn't a sacrifice, right? Yeah. yeah. I think that attitude, uh, as Alan, it translates into life itself, and so I always think about students and how they go through K through 12, and maybe um, their parent worked for the school or they gave a lot through PTA, and so they're used to sliding through or getting things. And so then when they come to college and the expectation, everybody is on the same level when mm -hmm. you get to there. There's no relationships. Um, and so it's that um, you don't really have to do the work, but you, give an A in the end. Mm -hmm. And so it kind of translates. We don't want to work hard anymore. Right. And I think that that's our job as <clears throat> women to teach the young women. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's very important, not just telling, but exemplifying in our lives what, what it is to be mm -hmm. a woman, a good mother, or it, even if you're not a mother, um, just a good person, a good, a, a good, especially now in society with the old ideology of changing roles and things like that. I think it's very important that in terms of femininity, that we continue to pass those traditions and those roles down to young women that this is the expectation of it. 
AC fans, this is how AC mm -hmm. mills uh, conduct herself and stuff like that. I took it to him at Jeff's party. Very good point. I think uh, just observing life, uh, I have a whole lot more uh, esteem and regard for someone <laughs> doing their job, whether it's mopping the floor, cleaning up after the sick, uh, someone that's doing that kind of work day in and day out, it's not a becoming to the world, but to me it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. and, and that's much more <clears throat> moving to me than, you know, a woman that, you know, got money and out there running the country club or whatever, <laughs> you know. Um, so I think, yeah, obviously we need to, uh, the attitude needs to be such that we honor and respect the things that God, and we've talked about some of them, that God expects of women. Uh, and that they've mentioned some of our young mothers and just raising children, the importance of do, do, you know, that, uh, far exceeds, uh, you know, going out and making Starbucks money. <laughs> <laughs> what, what she touched on too, the example that was set, the young people are learning from the older people. Yeah. And so it's whether it's our example of being here, um, how we speak to one another, what we're doing for each other, the activities. Um, our young people are always watching. The, the, mm -hmm. the young girls, mm -hmm. the young mothers, uh, we just feel really would always set a great example. Okay, anybody else? Very good point. Yeah. Thank you. Lesson five is 